always hang out. Okay. All right, can we leave one of the doors open until for, for five minutes? But close one door and leave one open for late okay. comers? Okay, guys. But I may not be here. So we'll we'll get up and close. We'll get it. We'll get it. We'll do it. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being adaptable. <laughs> Tis the season to be adaptable, is what I understand. <laughs> Um, there may be a couple of people who come over who didn't get the message that we were here. They may go looking for us in the fellowship hall, then they might come and find us here. So we're going to leave that door open. At some point, I might give you a, an ask to ask you to um, to close it because they prefer it to be closed, and it probably keeps the cold air out. So um, you have arrived at week two of speaking the name of Jesus uh, through Advent, and uh, we covered a lot of ground last week. And um, that's because we had some introductory material to cover. And I hope you found it useful to understand uh, all the mystery and power. Come on up. There's one here and there's three up here. There's one here. Thank you. Sure. Uh, all the power and the mystery associated not just with the name of God and the name of Jesus, but with names in general. And um, a couple of keys from last week are that we understand from Philippians that uh, the name of Jesus is so powerful. It is the name above all names. And um, we take, uh, that's the name at which every knee shall bow and um, that is exalted above all names. We understand that the name of Jesus is on par with the name of God. We looked at that pretty extensively through the I am. God is the great I am, and Jesus links himself to that through his language, through his behaviors, and through his actions. Um, but it's worth noting that when God revealed God's self to Moses in the burning bush with the words in the, the letters in Hebrew, yud He vav He, that we translate to be I am who I am, um, that, that was shrouded in mystery. And we looked for a minute at what it could mean that it was shrouded in mystery. And where I land, and you can land wherever you want, but where I land is that that mystery is because God is uh, not exactly fully knowable. There is something about our limitations, our mortality, the way that we think and are and be, whether we are constrained by language or constrained by thoughts and rationality, that we cannot fully understand uh, or speak about God. And I call that the ineffable quality of God. Um, so there is mystery about God. There is mystery surrounding God's name. And I think that opens the door for the fact that there are so many names by which we call on uh, the God of our ancestors, or yud he vav he or I am who I am, or Yahweh, and that the revelation of God through the person of Jesus is a continuation of unraveling that mystery in ways that humanity can understand. And so we continue. Uh, I introduced you last week to the Jesus Prayer. Uh, it takes up a page or so in last week's handout. Uh, the Jesus Prayer is very simple. It says, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And, um, and there's a whole uh, body of history and practice surrounding praying that prayer. If you're interested, I think I put enough information that you could ad begin to adopt that practice as a prayer. Um, but what we're doing is looking together at 30 names of Jesus um, for this Advent period. And I know Advent really starts on December 1st and ends on December 24th, and they're really only 24 days. But, but the 30-day challenge for us which is a separate handout, and you should get one if you did not. It, um, it gives us the opportunity to name a different name of Jesus every day for 30 days. And we started last Tuesday, so I think we should have enough names. And the goal of that is so that we can not only learn that there are different names for Jesus and what those names are, but that we can speak or pray different names because that helps invoke or tap into or evoke for us um, a little bit different uh, aspect or a characteristic or trait of God. 
God and all God's godness is showing up all the time. But sometimes we need Jesus the healer, sometimes we need Jesus the savior, sometimes we need Jesus the great I am. And, um, and so once we learn that there are these names and we learn what those names are, we can then develop a practice of um, invoking the power and the attributes of that name. So many of the names that we looked at last week, including I Am and True Vine and the Word um, and the Good Shepherd, link Jesus clearly to God. But they also invoked other meanings. The True Vine had that nurturing, feeding aspect of it. The Good Shepherd is, taps into the role of protector and healer. Um, and mercy and those kinds of things. And so we're gonna to continue today. Um, we move from the names of Jesus for people of hope to names of Jesus for people of faith. And um, I think faith is not a very well understood word. It's a very frequently used word, particularly in the Christian community. Um, but it's not always clear what we mean when we talk about faith in God and Jesus um, or what it means to be a person of faith. Um, but I'm just going to put a few propositions out there to get us connected before we go over the names for today. So in the Advent season particularly, faith is linked to hope. Our hope is in God. We have a hope that it transcends the circumstances of this time, the circumstances of this world, and that hope requires a faith beyond ourselves, a trusting, a belief in something that we cannot see. Um, in order to have that Advent hope, we have to be grounded in what I'm calling faith. Um, some might say that faith is the bedrock or the substance of our hope. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is the confidence of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And that, they use a Greek word there um, that is loaded with meaning, um, but it has trust and confidence and belief and that gives you a multifaceted picture that when we use one word, faith, we're really using a family of words around trust and um, confidence and belief. So the other thing to understand about faith is it's not passive. Um, it's, it's, we express our faith by action. And so calling on the name of Jesus is an action of faith. Uh, it, it shows that we, there, we believe there is something behind that name that can help us. And so if you can understand faith as a verb, in English we might call it faithing, but that would be awkward, so we just call it faith. Um, another way to talk about faith is that the faith is the experience of our hope. In other words, we can say we are hoping, but what does that look like? Well, that looks like calling on the name of God. That looks like saying out loud, this is not the way things are always going to be. And, and those are statements of faith. Um, so the Advent notion of faith is rooted in the Advent theme of waiting and waiting actively. And we are called during the season of Advent both to wait, and, but to do that vigilantly and actively. And um, so even if the promises of God are not fulfilled in our presence, we are called to have faith that those promises will be a reality. And um, that hit the Israelite community right where they lived. There were years of silence between when the last prophet spoke and when the Messiah, uh, Jesus, entered into humanity. And even though that waiting lingered for decades or centuries, God broke through at what we believe, because we have faith, at just the right time with the long expected Messiah. Um, I'm reminding you, you only need a tiny bit of faith. It's not about an amount, it's not a quantity, uh, but it is important to nurture it. Whatever faith you have, however small, however tiny, however immeasurable it might be to you or me, um, we are called to nurture it. And um, so that we can completely rely on uh, Jesus, trusting in his power, his intelligence, his love, um, it means, faith means believing that even though we do not understand all things, God and Jesus do. And so uh, two Bible verses to remind us that Jesus is the name above all names and uh, is from Acts. There is no other name under heaven given to man whereby we must be saved. That's Acts. Um, and then up to this, there's seats here, here, and here, and you won't bother me a bit. 
um, from John, up to this point you have not asked anything in my name. Whatever you ask in the Father in my name, he will give to you. So these just anchor us in uh, the concept of calling on the name of Jesus as an act of faith. So what names of Jesus shall we speak as people of faith? Um, we come to Luke 2.11. It's part of the birthing story. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. We did a Bible study on Luke the last time we were together, and what we observed in that Bible study together is that this is the beginning of the chapter of Luke, and Jesus is called Savior distinctively here in the birthing narrative. And he hasn't done anything yet. And, um, but that title, that aspect of Jesus being called Savior is uh, well developed in the Gospel of Luke, and so it's announced like a theme verse almost here. Um, how do we get to Savior? How does it come to pass that the angel is going to use the name Savior to identify Jesus, who is also identified as Christ the Lord? Um, well, the personal name of Jesus uh, comes from this word Yeshua, a short form of the, another Hebrew name, and generally Yeshua is thought to be translated G Yahweh saves. Yahweh, again, is how we say the unpronounceable vowel, uh, consonants of yud he vav he. So we have God reveals himself as yud he vav he. We transliterate that to Yahweh. Yahweh becomes Yeshua, which means Yahweh saves. And then I put here at the bottom of page three, for people interested in the migration of uh, Yehoshua to Jesus, you can trace it there. But basically, um, there are lots of aspects to the translation. If you start with Yahweh and you put it together, you come up with Yahweh saves, Yahweh is my help, um, and now I'm on page four. Um, by the time the New Testament was written, the Septuagint, the, the, the book written by the 70, was tra uh, transliterated Yeshua into Greek as closely as possible as they could for third century. And the result was this Greek word, which had no equivalent for the shin, so it was a sigma, but it basically looks like Jesus spelled with an I. Do you see that on the top of page four? Um, from the Greek, that Jesus word spelled with an I moved to the Latin word um, that became uh, looked a little bit more like Jesus, but still with an I. Um, finally, in modern English, um, we get to the J. Um, by the Frenchman Pierre Rasmus, Ramus, Ramus uh, does that. But anyway, the idea is the concept of Savior, Jesus as Savior, is built into the proper given name, Jesus. So that's the first thing we notice about the title, the name Savior, is that it's built in to the name of Jesus. And what we know is that when we call on Jesus as Savior, that is a statement of Christian faith. Historians can call Jesus, Jesus, and they're not saying anything other than what the name was that he was given, his given name. But when Christians call on Jesus as Savior, that is a statement of our faith. Um, and when we call on the name of Savior, we recognize that God is also a Savior or the Savior. God is Savior. And in case we didn't know that or didn't know that we knew it, um, in the Magnificat, that's the great song that Mary sings when she hears that she will be carrying Jesus. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Okay? So she is clearly reminding us that that Savior word, the title, the name, is linked to God because of her training and her faith. So God is Savior. Zechariah, we learned when we studied the, the Gospel of Luke, Zechariah also sings a song. Um, they call his song the Benedictus, but um, he says, blessed be the Lord God of Israel who has visited and redeemed his people. Redeemed is a saving word. Redeemed, so that links the, the common understanding about 
the title Savior is that Savior belongs to God for the people to whom God is revealing Jesus. So that's the first notion. And then um, he continues to say, he has raised up a horn of salvation for the house of his servant David. Um, so God as Savior raises up the horn of salvation and that horn of salvation we can identify, just come on up here, it's not gonna disturb anybody. That's, it's not your problem. We're making do for 45 minutes. Um, God as Savior, um, raises up Jesus, whom we identify as the horn of salvation. Um, because God loves us, he sent us to rescue us from our helpless state of bondage. And uh, that, the notion of rescue and redemption are contained in the title Savior. Um, God sent the Son, I'm at the top of page five. God sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that they might be saved through him. So right now we're just sort of we're just pulling out all of the uh, indications about what it means to call on Jesus as Savior. And the first observation is that we understand God is Savior. As a Savior delivers people from danger and from enemies, it is used only one time in the Old Testament to refer to a king, and that's in 2 Kings. Therefore, the Lord gave Israel a Savior so that they escaped from the hand of the Syrians. So human beings can be saviors too, and we, we've understood that. Somebody, I don't know what happens to you in the world that is a crisis, but let's say you got to the doctor's office and you forgot your insurance card, and you had to call somebody and say, can you bring me my insurance card? And they come and you say, oh my gosh, you're my savior. Thank you for bringing that insurance card. Uh, that's the notion that it is used here for a king. Um, so it means a person who saves, rescues, delivers, a person who rescues you from harm, danger, loss, one who saves from any form or degree of evil. And when the angels call Jesus a savior, they mean he is rescuing the people from some danger. Um, we could talk for hours and hours about what that danger is, but we understand it as a shorthand to mean uh, the danger of being human, uh, which is being slaves to sin and death. Um, Matthew 1:21 says she will bear a son and you should call his name Jesus. It doesn't use the same word savior, but it says for he will save his people from their sins. Again, Jesus has embedded in it the concept of saving. So you see how it's very easy to get from Jesus to savior. Um, we need a savior because we are powerless to save ourselves. Just like if you're standing in the doctor's office without your insurance card, there is nothing more you can do about it. You've told them what your insurance is, you think they have it in their computer, you've done everything you can do. Um, short of leaving and going to get your card and then missing your appointment, there is nothing you can do. And we need a savior of the world or of our souls because there is nothing we can do. Um, scripture tells us that Jesus is savior of the Jews and savior of the Gentiles, thus savior of the whole world. We also covered that in our Bible study together in Luke. Um, but the horn of salvation is for all people. Israel will be saved uh, along with the Gentiles. The deliverer will come from Zion and um, he will be a light for revelation to the Gentiles. So we have Israel and the Gentiles being named explicitly so that we can understand this savior is for the whole world. Um, that's what takes up the, the rest of page six. And then I put a link to a song. Um, if you are interested in Googling that song, it's at the end of the handout. I'm on the top of page seven now where Jesus's name is Cornerstone. Um, it shouldn't surprise you that there are names for Jesus that come from the Old Testament. Uh, we understand that Jesus was part of God's plan for the world uh, from the beginning. And if we understand that, we might expect to find names of Jesus in the Old Testament. And here we go to Isaiah, where uh, it says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. So Jesus as cornerstone means that he is the foundation. He is the measuring God, and he is the promise of God and creation. Uh, that is the idea of what Isaiah is saying about the cornerstone in that passage. 
In Isaiah 28, 16, God was speaking to the people of Judah, promising them a foundation for their lives. And we read this passage as God's promise to give Jesus as the foundation for their lives. They had not yet been introduced to the name of Jesus. That was revealed later. Um, but we look back and we say, clearly in Isaiah, um, this foundation that is being promised to these people is a reference to Jesus. And later, Jesus is the cornerstone in the New Testament, if you're looking for that link. Um, it says in Ephesians, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. I don't think it's an accident that Isaiah's words use cornerstone and that later in Ephesians, the writing picks up Christ as cornerstone. Expressing our Christian faith and being part of the body of Christ means putting our entire lives on Christ and making him our cornerstone. So when you speak or pray cornerstone, you're saying not only something about the nature of Jesus, but you're expressing your desire to base your life if you just call out Christ my cornerstone or Jesus cornerstone or even just cornerstone, maybe that's a sign that you're floating and you feel foundationless and you want to have a solid foundation to stand. Top of page eight, the righteous judge. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. In this scene, it's as if Paul is envisioning an award ceremony where he would receive a crown that Jesus has for him. The image stands in contrast to the fact that Paul was about to be condemned and executed by an earthly court. So see the irony of Paul facing execution in an earthly court, and he calls on or identifies the righteous judge, who not only is present, but is going to award a crown to the one whom humans are condemning. So the righteous judge. Most commentators believe that when we appear before the righteous judge that is described here, we will receive a crown as a reward for our faithfulness and service. I wanna be clear that the crown isn't the salvation for certain. You don't get rewarded with salvation because you are faithful. Salvation is a gift. Salvation has, the work for salvation was done by God through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And so if we're to have this metaphor of receiving the crown, then we receive that because in response to our salvation, we have served faithfully. We have served with the underpinnings of, uh, of God. And so what we believe is that God is, the, the righteous judge is God, but is also manifest in Jesus. And the righteous judge will not make mistakes. Human judges make mistakes all the time. Paul is exhibit A for human judges make mistakes all the time. We probably have a lot of exhibits B, C, D, and E in our lives where human judges got it wrong. Corrupt judges can be bribed and otherwise subject to unjust decisions according to all of their human limitations, the laws of sinful people, including those limitations. Jesus will give the right judgment in the right way, and we might also add at the right time. Um, this passage also harkens us back a little bit to Psalm 9, 8, where we hear he judges the world with righteousness, he judges the peoples with uprightness, and Psalm 72, may he judge your people with righteousness, your poor with justice. So um, maybe in a time when you think life is unfair, maybe when the system is against you or you, you are having trouble getting the relief that you need from the human systems of the world, you just name Jesus the righteous judge and invoke the powers uh, that that would bring and the peace that that would bring into your life. Top of page nine, son of God. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. This is when Mary asked, okay, I hear you, but how can this be? 
and the angel was gracious enough to say, I'll tell you how it can be. Um, this concept of Jesus as son of God appears early in the birthing story. We're still, Luke chapter one, we already got the name Jesus and savior, and now we're getting son of God. Um, but God also recognizes Jesus as son. And um, we have the baptism story. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice of the cloud said, this is my beloved son. Uh, with whom I am well pleased, listen to him. I think that might have been the, um, that Matthew 17 is the um, ascension, the, when he's on the mountain, the, the transformation, the transfiguration. But we have evidence in the scriptures where God is calling Jesus son of God, but we hear it in the announcement at his birth. Um, and then I've gone through on pages nine and 10, um, Paul recognized, uh, Peter recognized Jesus as Son of God. The demons recognized Jesus as the Son of God. Paul acknowledged Jesus as the Son of God. I'm on page 10. Jesus referred to himself as the Son of God. Uh, some say Adam was called a Son of God. Uh, it's not clear to me that uh, where it says the Son of Enosh, the Son of Seth, the Son of Adam, the Son of God if Adam was the son of God, or if that's another name in the list, but it's there. Israel was called the son of God. Angels are called sons of God. Humans are called God's sons. That takes us to the bottom of page 10. Top of page 11. If human beings and angels can be called sons of God, then in what sense, if any, is Jesus different? I think that's a fair question. Jesus was uniquely the son of God with a capital S and a capital G, of course, in that he possesses the same nature as God. Adam was a lowercase son of God, perhaps, in the sense that he was created directly by God. Um, he did not have a human father or mother. Angels are the sons of God in the sense that they were created by God. So we have creation by, that makes us sons or daughters of, and we have the nature of God. Um, Israel was symbolically or metaphorically called God's son, as were the peacemakers. That's, a, that's symbolism, a metaphor. Uh, believers are sons of God because of kinship with Christ. Um, but note that the name son of God does not indicate that Jesus was the literal offspring of God, his father. The Bible speaks of Jesus of having existed as God, with God, and from God for all eternity. So I just stopped right here in the middle of everything and said, this is a key point, take this away. When we call on Jesus by the name Son of God, we are making a statement of faith that Jesus possesses the nature of God. Not everybody in the world believes that. That is a unique statement of the Christian faith. Um, now we might say we possess the nature of God because we are created in God's image, but we are not, um, we don't possess the fullness of the nature of God, the way that Jesus does, and the way that Son of God signals to that. Um, obviously, we have John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. And we know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ, the true God and eternal life. All right, so just so you know, on page 12, the concept of the use of the word son to mean possessing the nature of or in the order of, it happens elsewhere in the Bible. In Ephesians, it talks about the sons of disobedience. Um, in Kings, it talks about the sons of the prophets. Um, I'm at the middle of page 12. These are not the literal offspring of the prophets. These are not literal offspring of disobedience, but those um, who are in the same line of thinking or acting. So God the Father, the angel Gabriel, his own disciples, the apostle Paul, and even the demons acknowledge Jesus as son of God. And although all these humans and angels can be called sons of God, God, uh, Jesus possesses the same nature as God the Father. Not a literal offspring, but he has existed for all eternity. And the title son does not any way suggest that the son is inferior to the father. I think that's important to know. Turning to page 13. Mighty God. 
this is going back again to Isaiah. Uh, it's a famous passage. We know it from the Bible and from Advent readings and from the Messiah. For unto us a child is born, unto us a, sa a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The prophet Isaiah was writing about a future child, a son, who is given, and his says his name shall be called Mighty God. This Mighty God, like all those other names, but we're focused on Mighty God, is understood to be Jesus. It's a translation of the Hebrew El Jabor, which is used by Isaiah to describe Messiah as the one who has the wisdom and counsel to govern and the might to be effective. Um, El Jabor is a very rarely used term uh, uh, compared to other names of God. Um, but the, the Hebrew word El, which gets translated to God, is one of the most common terms in the Old Testament to refer to a God. And when combined with an attribute such as Jabor, it becomes specific to our God. You might call it the God, the God who, the God who is mighty, the God who is strong. Um, it contains not only might and strength, but bravery and courage and action. So this is not just a strong God who sits there flexing his muscles. This is a God who acts with that strength. And um, we may be tempted to shrink away from this mightiness of God and think of it as military language even, but this does identify Jesus as a great warrior. And I believe there are times in our lives where we want to call on the name of Jesus in his capacity as a great warrior. There are battles to be fought in our own lives. There are battles to be fought in the lives of those whom we love. And that may be the time where we call on mighty God um, as opposed to choosing any of the other names. Um, physical and spiritual battles have raged across human history and are still being fought today. Mighty God points us to the day when all God's enemies, physical and spiritual, will be vanquished and all of creation will bow to the feet of Jesus, who's also going to be called Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. So hold on to Mighty God as one of your names of Jesus and, and learn to pray that. Um, to invoke comfort and confidence as you engage the battles of your daily life. And then um, I called to mind that the hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, which says, I am weak, but thou art mighty. It's amazing to me how many, uh, how the language of our old hymns and the language of prayers and the things that people have used for centuries have um, tap into these different names of Jesus in the same way that we're doing it. We're just doing it with a fresh look. <coughs> Jesus, perfecter of our faith, from Hebrews 12, verse 2, fixing our eyes upon Jesus. This might be another famous one as well. The founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. To understand the concept of perfecter of our faith, we need to look at this name in the context of what happened right before it in Hebrews. It says in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, Therefore we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. So we're in a race, and there's a cloud of witnesses. And there's a group of Christians, maybe in this time, to whom the letter was written, who are undergoing persecution and imprisonment because of their association with Jesus. And that may tempt some of the followers of Jesus to walk away and abandon their faith. And, and the encouragement here is don't walk away, don't abandon your faith, because you have the perfecter of your faith um, with you. The letter encourages them to stay the course because Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God's love and mercy, and God will never abandon them, even when it's tough, even when it's hard, even when it looks hopeless. The passage is built around this metaphor of a sporting event, uh, drawing the comparison before, between training for and completing an athletic feat and the suffering of the people who received the letter. Hold on a second. The cloud of witnesses referred to are the heroes of the Christian faith cheering them on, much like a crowd would be cheering people on at a sporting event. And the author's encouragement says, uh, lay aside every weight and burden. Put down everything else. 
everything that's clinging to your legs and is weighing you down for this, right? Put it away, put it away, put it away, and focus on Jesus because he is the perfecter of our faith. Um, laying aside anything that's heavy or keeps us from staying close to Jesus is important because we need to run with endurance and we can be assured that we will finish this journey not, because not only is Jesus author, he wrote it, uh, but he is the perfecter um, and he will help us finish it. That's the top of page 16. Jesus is called the perfecter of our faith. The Greek word for perfecter can be translated finisher or completer. He's not only the first cause or author of our faith, but he sees us through to completion. So whenever we experience difficult circumstances, we are called to fix our eyes on Jesus, the perfecter of our faith, and consider the one who endured so much so that we do not grow weary. Um, there's a few other notes there, but the perfecter of our faith, I think, will just will see us through. When we are weary, when the journey has been long, when we think we have nothing left, the perfecter of our faith will see us through. The creator of all, from Colossians 1.16. For by him all things were created, that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him, and for him. So here we glean that Jesus can be called creator of all things. This means that creation as described in the book of Genesis took place by the power of Jesus the Son as well as by the power of the Father and the Spirit. This name highlights that all-encompassing nature of Jesus' creative power. And it hearkens us back to Jesus being the Word who was in the beginning. Um, it connects to that. It's, it doesn't stand out here in an island all by itself. Um, but it, it's important that it's not just the visible but the invisible. It's not just the thrones and dominions and powers. All things were created. Uh, angels and a, this is a statement of faith to say uh, creator of all. Lord Jesus, creator of all, is a statement of faith that Jesus is God and that the reality is a result of the power of Jesus. The reality that came into being in Genesis, the reality that has been, the reality that is, and the reality that will be, because Jesus is the creator of all. <coughs> Light of the world, page 17. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. At the most basic level, we see this name, light of the world, uh, given in the second I am statement of Jesus as that which guides us through darkness. So we, 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 we don't even need interpretation. We hear the language, I am the light of the world. I will guide you through darkness. Jesus comes to a world longing for light. This is a powerful uh, metaphor and image that we take in the church through Advent all the time. We, we're hearing this constant, we light candles, we have a Christ candle, our liturgy points to this light of the world concept. Those who walked in darkness have seen a great light. We read that every year, maybe two or three times during December and on Christmas Eve as well. Um, those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them, a light has shown. But let's go back to the beginning. God's first act of creation said, let there be light. In him was life, and that was the light of all mankind from John. The true light gives light to everyone who is coming into the world. So when we describe Jesus as light, we understand that everything that opposes Jesus is darkness. That's a powerful statement. I'm going to let, let that marinate with you and sit on it. But understand this. Not only do we live in a dark world and the light comes in, but light versus dark is a conflict that has appeared throughout humanity. It is well documented in the Bible. And um, so the comparison of light to dark helps us better understand light. If I want, have you ever seen these? It, you'd see like black and white together and the white looks whiter because it's next to the black. So to understand something about light, it's useful to put it next to its companion, dark. And when we do that, we see the synonyms for dark um, our wickedness and evil and misery in hell. And, and then we see that it's not just, yay, light came into the darkness. It is the power of light to dispel the power of darkness. And the power of darkness contains all those other things. 
Um, the theme of light comes out in Zechariah's song, <coughs> which we talked about earlier. Uh, the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in the darkness. Again, this isn't just, oh my gosh, the sun went down, it's dark. This is the pervading darkness, the evil, um, the wickedness, the resultant misery in hell, darkness. And one way to understand what Jesus meant by I am the light of the world is to picture a ship in a tumultuous sea at night, and though the ship can't see what's ahead of it, it follows a lighthouse's light toward its home on the shore. And our relationship with Jesus might be described in the same way. We can't see our future direction or destination, but Jesus can. And like the lighthouse that guides the ship, Jesus directs or calls us toward God's light. Um, we are surrounded by darkness, but we don't have to stumble through it blindly. Um, so speaking light of the world as a name for Jesus is a statement of faith because we understand there is one who is lighting our way and we don't need to go through life blindly. Um, I put another link to a song, bottom of page 18 tells you that that is the link to the song. So we have come to the end of our names of Jesus. My goal is that I've given you enough information about these names so that when you go back to this, this week, whatever day you're on, maybe you have this on your refrigerator, maybe you've checked off the days you've already spoken the name of Jesus, and you you start with um, the day, I think it will be day six. For there, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a savior. So you would start today with savior and then go seven tomorrow, call on a different name of Jesus. And uh, if you are a mind of journaling or something, you might write down what your connection to calling on that name of Jesus is, what need it speaks to in your soul. And you may not, it, we think about like, oh, we have a need, let's call on Jesus. It may be the other way around. Let's call on Jesus the mighty and that will remind us of a struggle that we have damped down inside of us that needs our attention, that needs the light of Christ. We might call on Jesus the light as a spiritual discipline or a prayer practice for Advent, and that will open something up inside of us where we needed light and we didn't even know enough to ask. So I hope that you get enough information about these names that you can speak them and, um, and if you're of a mind to Google the songs that I included in last week's handout and the songs that I've included here, I, I think that will add to your practice of speaking and praying the names of Jesus. And I'll see you next week, and I think we'll be back in the fellowship hall. I don't have a watch today, so I don't know what time it is. Two minutes early. All right. Two Victoria said, did you wear your black and white